sometimes we have a lack of capability to diagnose these, these issues. And over time, they just grow into a, an ever more bigger problem. Hi, my name is Carlos Banis. I am customer care and uh, mechatronics product business manager at DNX Emissions. Welcome to another episode of the Heavy Duty Parts Report. My name is Jamie Irvin and I'm your host. I'm really excited to have Carlos with me today to talk about diesel emission systems and after treatment products. We're going to get into the trends related to these products in the industry right now in 2023. And I'm, I'm excited about getting his perspective because of the global nature of the company that he works for. So let's get started. Carlos, welcome to the Heavy Duty Parts Report. So glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. Let me ask you something. From your perspective, uh, you, you get to work with people all over the world and diesel emission systems have been on trucks now 16, 17 years. We see additional regulation coming in places like in North America and the United States with the EPA's new um, regulations coming in 2027. So we know that as long as there are ICE vehicles, these systems aren't going anywhere. What do you see as uh, one of the trends as it relates to maintenance right now in 2023? So as of now, since we are in 2023, as you just said, the after, after treatment systems in diesel engines are getting ever more complex. And like you also said, this trend is uh, not about to reverse itself anywhere, anywhere soon. Because of these regulations, emission regulations that are getting ever more stringent, we are seeing that uh, we need to utilize a lot more after treatment technology in the systems to keep on par with the regulations. So back in the day when we first started introducing the first after treatment systems, those are quite simple, either a simple DPF system or an SCR system. But nowadays, uh, it is not enough with just one or the other. We need to use the full range of all the after treatment components that we know of. And to monitor all those components and to ensure that they are operating efficiently, we need to introduce ever more mechatronics components into these systems, such as injectors, pumps, control units, uh, other components, uh, sensors. Whenever we have a system that consists of all of these components together, then it becomes ever more crucial to follow the maintenance of these systems. And we see now that uh, because these systems are so complicated uh, at this time, then maintenance becomes a real issue because there's so many items to maintain. And not just that, but uh, also what happens to one of them has the effect on another. And so in a sense, if you are having a problem somewhere in your engine, if you are having problems somewhere in your exhaust system, during time, it can grow serious enough as to throw out the, uh, the all after treatment system rather just one or, or the other component of it. Let, let me ask you something. When it comes to this complexity, there's a lot to break down in what you just said. So first of all, do you think that it is really an issue with the quality of the technology that's in these systems that, that is the problem that causes failure? Or do you think that it's more that there is a lack of ability to diagnose these issues and this creates like a compounding effect that then causes a failure in the system. Like what, what is the, what is more likely there? I think the technology is definitely not to blame here. Technology is, uh, is up to date. It's uh, what we have at this time. It's uh, sufficient for all of these tasks, but, uh, the problem here, as I see it is, uh, something along the lines from what you said is that perhaps sometimes we have a lack of capability to diagnose these, these issues and over time they just grow into a, an ever more bigger problem. So this is the issue in, uh, in my view. Okay. So when you're working with your, your customers and your customers' customers, of course, because you're selling through distribution, what is the strategy? What's the best strategy right now to help customers, especially the end users, the, the, the technicians that have to work on the equipment, in order to empower them to be able to diagnose these systems correctly. What is your opinion on how we should go about that? I think the first and most, uh, most important thing is to actually be aware of all of the problems that could happen in the system and how they affect the other components. Once you are aware of these problems, you start to get a tendency to know where to look for them. 
For example, uh, we know that uh, an oil leak, a very simple issue in the system, could become a problem because it has the potential to ruin the DPF, to ruin the uh, catalysts, to ruin the NOx sensor. And afterwards, when the DPF fills completely, it has the potential to ruin all of the system. And it could be very easy to check for oil leaks while doing maintenance on your uh, collector or on your turbo just to see if it's uh, if it's leaking oil in places where it shouldn't be. So some people have a really hard time grasping that concept. How do we actually find out that we have this problem? It could also be as simple as uh, while doing the uh, doing the DPF replacement or reconditioning to simply check uh, on the DPF surface if you have any oil stains, if you have any coolant stains. Once you know where to look for these problems, you are better informed uh, about what are the potential causes for them. One of the things I understood is that when the OEMs first started rolling out these systems, go back 10, 15 years ago, there was this idea that these systems were going to be able to run for hundreds of thousands of, of kilometers or miles before ever needing any maintenance. We have the benefit now of looking backwards. I think we know that that's not true. I think we know that that maintenance is required. So how do you educate customers on what kinds of preventative maintenance they should be engaging in? To be honest, the best place to look for what kind of preventative maintenance is required is actually the uh, service manual of the truck manufacturer. Because the manufacturer has been designing the system, the engineers have had uh, the calculations on the table for each and every component, so they are well aware of what is the service time and service limit for each of the components, and all that information is carefully listed in the manual. Now, of course, not all of these uh, shops or all of the customers have actually the access to these uh, service repair manuals. In this way, we try to accumulate some sort of uh, experience uh, background some sort of knowledge base from which to operate and uh, give our suggestions to our customers based on what we have found in the, in the field in the past. Okay, so that that's a good point because when you get your service manual, that's of course a, a description for that vehicle, but it doesn't necessarily take into account vocation. So you could have one vehicle manufactured to a certain spec doing over the, the highway kind of type miles, they're out on the highway long miles, um, you know, pulling in one environment, and then you might have that same truck, but it's rigged now for logging or or oil and gas or mining or off road applications. So same same manufacturer, same engine, same after treatment system, two completely different vocations. So how do you go about educating customers on how they can customize uh, their preventative maintenance plan to the vocation that they're in? Well, this really has to do with uh, a lot of experience that we have acquired, a lot of knowledge. There is no easy way at, uh, of looking at it. It's uh, simply taking what we know, applying to each and every situation, looking back what other experience we have had with uh, similar customers and extending that, uh, those uh, observations to our potential customers if necessary. Right. I think good record keeping is also really important in this. Um, one of the things I've seen for example, when you're when you're measuring uh, your DPFs and you're you know you're weighing them, you're before a clean, after a clean, like making sure that you understand how many miles or kilometers are put on that vehicle. If the vocation is going to change, do you have any other vehicles in the fleet that worked in a similar vocation in the past? Like all of that data seems to me really important in helping fleets make more educated decisions. Would you agree with that? No, definitely, sir. Yes. Okay. Great. Well, let's end our first segment on a note where we both have complete agreement. Let's uh, hear from our sponsors. We'll be right back. This episode of the Heavy Duty Parts Report is brought to you by Find It Parts, your ultimate destination for heavy duty truck and trailer parts. Discover a vast range of parts at finditparts.com. Don't spend hours a day looking for parts. Instead, visit finditparts.com and get them right away. Parts availability and quality have a big influence on fleets and owner operators' total cost of operation. If they can't find a part, it means more downtime. If they install a low quality part and it fails, it means even more costs like tow bills, hotels, meals for the driver, and lost revenue. That's why we recommend Sampa. They manufacture a wide range of advanced parts for commercial vehicles. Their website has an intelligent product search engine and broad coverage of suspension, steering, and fifth wheel components. Expect more. Expect Sampa. 
Visit sampa.com today. We're back from our break. And before the break, it was good to talk to you about some of the trends in the industry in 2023 of after treatment systems. So we've talked a little bit about the importance of preventative maintenance. I'd like to learn a little bit more about your product line. So first of all, can you talk to us about the product line as a whole? And then I think you wanted to get into some specifics. So first of all, kind of give us an overview for those who don't know um, what your product line in, encompasses. Dnex was uh, founded uh, in uh, 1982 by uh, Greta and Jorgen Dinesen in Denmark, and uh, it started purely as an aftermarket uh, manufacturer for heavy-duty commercial vehicles. And over time, we have been expanding into on an international scale. Not only that, but uh, we have also expanded to the OEM business, and uh, that is to prove our customers that we are not only on par with the uh, technology, we can also uh, compete with the OEMs in terms of uh, utilizing the same technology that we have in-house for both OEM and aftermarket productions. We came to North America in approximately 2011. So uh, that is uh, some time away from uh, foundation of the company. So by the time when we came to North America, we were already, uh, already established in Europe with uh, quite a foothold. So we are now facing the, uh, the challenge to establish a similar foothold also in, uh, in North America. As we spoke previously, uh, then uh, with the introduction of these uh, new establishment systems, which has also been uh, part of our product line, we are uh, extensively manufacturing and researching all of the after-treatment components. DOCs, SCRs, DPFs, those come also certified uh, to prove that uh, we know actually what we do. And uh, because of all of these components, we see that uh, as we spoke, the trend is to include ever more mechatronics components in these systems. So this is really our newest product line that has been the uh, most recent development to add uh, one by one, starting with the NOx sensor, many different uh, mechatronics components, such as the temperature sensor, also the pressure sensor. Then uh, one of our recent developments is also the DEF pump and DEF injector. And we are, of course, extensively looking forward to developing some more. Right. So you're, you're looking to uh, provide a complete after treatment line. What about things like um, clamps and gaskets and, and those other auxiliary parts that are very important when changing some of the larger uh, components like a DPF? Sure enough, we have plenty of those in our catalog. This is a sort of a sideline to our main production. Right, right. But, but important when changing out those components. The fact that you also manufacture the SCR is, uh, is significant too, because not all of the people in North America who sell after treatment are able to offer the SCRs. So that's good, especially with that EPA regulation coming in 27. I understand that one of the ways the manufacturers are going to go is to, is to double the SCRs in those systems. Okay, so let's talk specifically about sensors. You listed quite a few of them, but let's focus in on your NOx sensor. What particularly makes your NOx sensor, let's say, different or differentiated from other people who are manufacturing that same sensor for the same application? Well, the first thing I would like to mention is that we have been in this uh, business, we've been one of the first ones to actually offer an aftermarket NOx sensor. So we have a little bit of experience behind us and uh, we have been well aware of all of the problems that are uh, happening in the market. We have, uh, we are well aware of all of the issues that are causing those, and uh, we have had enough time to actually take a good step back and and look at uh, what have been the real issues and how we can solve them. Well, the NOx sensors could have. Uh, I would really like to split those into two different problems. The first one is quite a painful one, and the second one is uh, a logical problem. So. The painful problem is really the software issue. And uh, because we are an aftermarket player for the NOx sensor, then uh, it is only natural that we are the direct competitor of the OE manufacturers. And uh, the OE manufacturers are also the ones who design the software that is used inside the NOx sensor because it's considered one of the smart sensors. And that's because it has its own little computer that does its own little calculations and then its own communication with the engine control unit. So that means the NOx sensor is quite an advanced component. It is not your just rudimentary sensor. And that requires uh, a specific software, which is specific not only between different manufacturers, but also between different models with the same manufacturer. And uh, the way how the aftermarket works 
with these sensors is that uh, they are developed uh, using what's called reverse engineering. So that is uh, taking an existing NOx sensor, plugging that to the truck and listening to the communication. And then from the communication that you have listened to, you are trying to replicate the software which is causing this communication to happen. And the first after, uh, aftermarket NOx sensors were not really good at this job. And another issue was that uh, over time, as the aftermarket NOx uh, sensor business grew, then uh, the OEM started to find ways how to actually win back some of that market share. And one of that, uh, one of those ways was through the software updates where they would uh, issue an update package that is delivered to the truck. It is then installed. And as a result of this update, the aftermarket NOx sensor would cease to function. And so this was really a painful topic. A lot of after, aftermarket NOx sensors were stopping to operate and nobody knew what the problem is. So that's why many customers chose to go with the, uh, with the OE rather than the aftermarket. And the second issue, of course, uh, is the maintenance topic. And uh, because of the importance of uh, preventative maintenance, especially with the mechatronics, then uh, we know that all, all kinds of issues that can happen with the engine, that can happen with the aft treatment system, all of that has, the, has an effect on the NOx sensor. And it just so happens that the NOx sensor is one of the most fragile components inside the aft treatment system. So it will be the first one that will feel the direct effect of these, uh, of these issues that could be caused by lack of preventative maintenance. Yeah, that makes sense. How did your company go about solving some of these issues and, and be able to bring out a NOx sensor that was going to work for, for people in the long term? So really, uh, the way how we proceeded was to uh, take, take the way of learning from our past mistakes. And uh, we have taken enough time, been in the business for enough time to actually try and uh, do continuous development, not only to the product itself, but also to the business. And uh, from the business side, what we have uh, really put our focus on is the handling of the business and handling of the claims and also uh, helping our customers learn and become more aware about so all of the issues that can happen with an OX sensor, how to prevent them, how to correct them and what to do in each, uh, each situation. Then from the product itself, then uh, it has been the result of continuous improvement. We have updated not only our hardware, but uh, also our software. And uh, we have become smarter in just the same way how the uh, OEMs have become smarter in figuring out how to win back some market share. Now we have done the same with our newest generation NOx sensor. So we hope it uh, brings great success to us. Yeah, and I, I really like the two-tiered approach, right? Because yes, there's a product solution there, but there's also that education, training, and collaborative work with the customer. Uh, to give them a solution. And so I can see how when you bring those two together, it's made the product uh, much, much more successful. Well, I, I want to thank you for taking some time to talk to us about after treatment. It's an ongoing challenge for fleets to uh, keep their cost of operation down. Uh, we recognize preventative maintenance is, is a key to that, but we also need good partnerships with our supply network. And so we really appreciate what you're doing for the trucking industry. Thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was my pleasure. So if you'd like to learn more about these products, go to DynexEmissions.com. Links will be in the show notes. Thank you again for listening to today's episode. If you have not already done so, head over to HeavyDutyPartsReport.com and make sure you follow the show. You can sign up to our weekly email so you never miss out on any great content. If you prefer to listen to the podcast on your favorite podcast player, you can follow for free wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like the video version, head over to YouTube and give us a subscribe. As always, we like to encourage you to be heavy duty. Thanks for listening. Thank you for watching this video. Click here to subscribe to the Heavy Duty Parts Report YouTube channel and click here to watch another great episode.